everyone and welcome back to the 2022 Oregon Active Transportation Summit. My name is Cassie Wilson. I go by she, her pronouns, um, and I'm the community engagement assistant for the Street Trust. Um, and welcome to Bike Index Presents Fighting Bike Theft in 2022. Uh, throughout the presentation, you can type your questions in the chat or use the raise hand tool. Both are found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you're posting about the session on social media, please use the hashtag Oats22 so we can reshare your posts about the summit. And don't forget to visit our website at thestreettrust.org to learn more about our other programs and activities. So with that, I will pass it off to Brian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me and see my slides okay. Uh, I am Brian Hance. Um, we were gonna run this, there's myself uh, and Steve Piercy, uh, who will be joining as well. Uh, I'm gonna talk for about half the session and then Steve will also uh, follow up after that. And hopefully we'll generate some questions and we're gonna try to leave about five to 10 minutes uh, once this presentation is over so people can uh, ask questions. Uh, so real quick, uh, who am I? Why am I here? Why are you listening to me? Uh, I'm a co-founder of Bike Index. Uh, Bike Index is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit that focuses on bike registration and bicycle recovery. We do free registrations. Uh, we pioneered the ability to register bikes in bike shops as they are sold at point of sale systems. Uh, we do a lot of intelligence and data sharing with um, victims and communities and law enforcement and cities and universities. Uh, of late, we've been doing some really interesting projects uh, that are deep dives into bad guys who steal and resell bikes, and I'll be talking about that in my session. Uh, we have a ton of bikes on file. I don't want to throw a bunch of stats at people, but we have you know, almost 800,000 bikes on file. We have about 10,000 recoveries for an estimated $18 million worth of value. We have about 1,300 partners. We just, we deal with a lot of partners and a lot of bikes. Um, and more importantly, we register and we recover a lot of bikes. Um, we are on a lot of platforms. If you're, if you wanna follow me on Twitter or Instagram, please feel free. It's just that bike index. Um, you know, the, the quantifying things is always really hard. Um, we have a lot of data that we share with our various partners and people always wanna know like how, you know, how big is the problem? Um, our average stolen bike value is about $1,700 right now. Uh, that has increased significantly due to e-bikes and the adoption of e-bikes that, that used to be in the 1200 range. Um, but we use this base value to sort of figure out, you know, how big is the problem? Uh, in 2021, we saw about $33 million worth of bikes get stolen. Um, that was reported to us. Um, I, I pulled Seattle and Portland. Uh, we, we have the ability to pull stats for any city that we operate in. So if you are, are curious about your own area and you want to email me after this and, and want to see what the numbers look like for your city, please feel free. Um, but just to give you an idea, uh, and you know, in Seattle in 2021, there's 1743 bikes are stolen, which is just north of $3 million. Um, we helped recover about 210 of these, which is about $369,000, and we have no, no official partnerships up there whatsoever. These are purely community recoveries that are, that are being run by bicyclists, by bike shops, uh, by people in the community. Um, Portland has a little bit lower in numbers, but it's still a significant amount of money. Um, and, you know, this crowd kind of gets it. <laughs> What is the impact to a rider? You know, people on this call probably don't need to be told this, but you know, strangely enough, more theft means less bikes, as bikes typically means more cars. And we know this because we ask our victims about this. We we run many uh, surveys with our victims to ask things about you know quality of life impact. Is this impacting your ability to get to, to get to work? You know, are you more likely to drive a car? Are you more likely to revert to old uh, forms of transportation because of your bike thefts? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, we also study financial impact on victims, um, and I, I, that could probably be a whole other session, but the gist is because bikes fall on this really weird sweet spot of do I want to eat the insurance deductible or do I not want to eat the insurance deductible, a lot of victims will absorb that cost 100%. Um, and we also see, you know, multiple repeat victims. It, People who are on their third or fourth or fifth bike getting stolen, there, there's an inflection point where they definitely throw in the towel and just say, you know what, I'm going to go back to my car. Um, and we, we have all kinds of numbers around this that quantify this, but this is exactly why we're here and this is exactly what we want to combat. 
there's also a huge impact to bike shops. Uh, we deal with a lot of bike shops um, on a daily basis. And the, the gist of it is there's a rampant illegal market that depresses a legitimate market. Um, there are bike shops that are competing with thieves who make, you know, 98% on those on those bikes that they're selling. And it, it's just sort of, it rigs the game. Um, bike shops have a really hard time uh, competing, you know, if I'm looking at a bike and I can get that bike for half off on Craigslist or off rut because it's stolen and I'm just going to look the other way, that bike shop is not going to make that sale. Um, the last couple of years have been really hard for a lot of shops because the, the triple whammy of COVID and then supply chain issues. And then, you know, they've had to deal with their own uh, thefts and robberies. Um, and not to mention, you know, there's, there's a physical security aspect that, you know, there, there are individuals that have been injured and, and on the example on the slide, you know, a store manager was run over during a, a theft attempt. Um, so it's not, it's not just riders, the, the sort of retail ecosphere takes a hit as well uh, because of the theft issue. Um, so what does it look like in 22? Uh, it's not great. <laughs> I, I can't lie. Uh, thieves have all the advantages. Um, for many victims, it's hard, if not impossible, to get police assistance. Um, and, you know, that's neither here nor there. There's many reasons for why that is, uh, but th that's just how it is in 2022. Um, the online illegal marketplace is, you know, a huge driver of uh, why people steal and resell bicycles. And what I get to see mostly is that, you know, it's not, it's not just a theft anymore. It's that victims get this added insult of, I have been robbed. I have found my bike for sale online. No one is assisting me with this. Now I get to watch the bad guy, you know, sell my bike and make a profit. Um, and, you know, the, the upshot is it's kind of up to the community to, to fill the, the void here, to, to step up and try to solve this problem. And that is squarely where, where Bike Index fits into this equation. Um, if you have ever had anything stolen in your life, uh, I suggest you check out OfferUp. Uh, they are by far the, the, the worst possible offender in this space. They're an online app akin to Craigslist, but more, more visual. Um, but the app itself is almost entirely designed to um, facilitate crime, in my opinion. There's, there's a lot of anonymization. There's a lot of abilities that they uh, give to users to, to hide their names, to, to sort of obfuscate who they are and where they are. Um, the app itself has almost zero enforcement, uh, zero customer service. In the instances where they do get involved with thefts or, or crimes, uh, they do nothing. They simply offload it to local law enforcement. Uh, so they have sort of privatized the profit and, and publicized uh, the, the customer service. <clears throat> uh, I, I cannot, you know, my, my inbox is probably 90% the service every single day. Uh, there are other operators in the space that are bad, like Facebook Marketplace and, you know, everybody's favorite Craigslist, but I, I cannot understate how much this service drives online fencing and crime in pretty much every city that we operate in. Um, they are uh, the target of a, a bunch of lawsuits uh, specifically because they are poorly operated. Uh, there's a double murder in Denver uh, that they are currently in, in court over and we're, we're watching that pretty closely. Um, so we, we get to see, you know, we've been doing this for so long and we have so much data, we get to see a lot of who the operators are. Um, and I'm just going to go over real quick what the what the theft ecosphere looks like. Um, your small fry are, I call them sort of like one-off thieves. Uh, it's typically, you know, people who are doing the theft and then attempting to sell the bikes. Um, we get all sorts of surveillance video of these guys. These are sort of what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. These are low-level guys. There's usually, you know, drugs and weapons are usually part and parcel with uh, what you find when you end up chasing these guys. Uh, their tactics are extremely simple. Um, they are usually fencing bikes in the same town that they stole them. They don't really cooperate a whole lot with others and maybe just small groups. Um, they don't really have great operational security. They're using their own names and their own phone numbers. They're, they're pretty overt about it. Um, they do a lot of online fencing, uh, which is where their, their real names come in. This is, this is sort of like the bread and butter of bike theft. And, and I think you know, the, the majority of the thefts can be attributed to, to operators like this. There's a medium layer <laughs> that is incredibly troubling. Um, these are larger um, people that work in the resale space. They're usually moving about 10 to 50 bikes per week. 
they're selling from a bigger stable. Um, they have a bit of an overlap with uh, like commercial thievery is, is about the best way I can say it. Um, they do have some more up, more advanced techniques. They will move bikes from town to town, from state to state. Uh, they will cooperate with others. <clears throat> they will sometimes, you know, hire or pay uh, others to go do um, the online sale meetups. So there's a bit of a distance between themselves and and you know uh, a sale. Um, they'll use burner phones. They'll use counter meetup tactics to make sure that if a victim is coming to check out a bike, that you know law enforcement is not accompanying them. Um, there's one, the, the picture that I show in this slide, there's, there's one person in the Tacoma area that we've been tracking for a long time, um, who is basically gray market. Um, this, when I was creating the slides, this person had 106 bikes up for sale, uh, for an estimated, you know, 52 grand in, in total value. This person has already been caught multiple times in multiple jurisdictions uh, selling stolen bikes because we we basically ID them and, and can route victims to this guy all day long. Um, each individual jurisdiction typically just gives them a slap on the wrist, um, does, does not really do any enforcement, um, does not see the bigger picture of, hey, you know, this, this guy has 99 other bikes for sale, maybe we, maybe we should look into that. Uh, and they are operating completely unimpeded on, on offer up. Um, so we we tend to watch operators like this because we know that's where bad bikes are going to wind up. Um, and we, we find them there almost every single day. There are much larger operators um, that we have been involved with more, more recently that are on the scale of thousands of bicycles. Uh, these are few and far between, but they are pretty amazing when you can uncover one. Um, they have a strict organizational hierarchy. <laughs> they have multiple individuals so they have you know they have thieves that are doing the thefts they have uh, transport guys whose whole sole job it is to move bikes from a to b uh, and in this case from from uh, usa to mexico and then they have dedicated fences whose entire job is just selling the the product um, they're often closely tied to uh, commercial robbery so there are, are crews of, of burglars that are casing um, targeting and breaking into uh, bike shops and bike retailers um, their fences will have, um, they'll basically masquerade as resellers. There's a sort of a veneer of legitimacy. Um, they have much more advanced operational security. Um, the one that we chased that I'm going to be talking about here in a minute uh, was using a region locked Facebook page to make sure that American victims could not see their bikes for sale in, in Mexico. Um, a lot of them use private WhatsApp groups that are just, you know, it's invite only. Um, this the one that we did a recent investigation on was called Alexander's Bikes. They have been operating since 2014, uh, had almost 50,000 followers <laughs> on his uh, Facebook page where he would basically post ads every single day. Uh, and he was the subject of a year long bike index investigation, which I'm going to go into here in a moment to show you sort of this is this is the big fish. These are the these are the larger ones out there. Um, we were involved with an investigation that was tracking bikes stolen in Colorado that were winding up in, in Juarez, Mexico. And as part of that investigation, we captured over a thousand individual sales, uh, you know, the bikes, individual bikes that this guy was selling, um, comprised of about 15,000 photos. Um, and we, we capped it just about exactly at one year for this, this one seller. Um, we were able to match many of these bikes to, um, you know, it wasn't just one city, it wasn't just one jurisdiction, it was uh, every city, every jurisdiction, every, every possible manner of theft, uh, every possible manner of bike, uh, but they were all winding up with this one seller. So we, uh, we took this data and we published a massive archive and an article um, sort of explaining what we had found uh, about this seller in, in December. Um, one of the most interesting bits of fallout from this is we we you know I I am in Portland Oregon I'm I'm you know I'm an American guy I don't really uh, move in in Mexican Facebook cycling circles but the amount of contacts we had from the Mexican cycling community about you know who is this guy how does he operate what's the market like was was sort of amazing um, to this day I'm still receiving tips and we're still matching bikes uh, from this investigation. Um, what this guy would do is he would he would have bikes and he would put 15 to 20 high resolution photos of each bike in his sales. Um, some of those bikes uh, still had their Colorado bike shop stickers on them. 
and which is one that I've shown here. Um, one of the other things we were interested in was, you know, how quickly were bikes going from Colorado to Mexico. Um, Gorilla Gravity is a, is a brand that's located in Colorado that uh, was, was robbed in November of, of 2021. And by December, uh, this seller was already moving uh, the bikes that were stolen in that robbery. And we know this uh, because Gorilla Gravity bikes have serial numbers in a non-standard place. They're, they're right up by the handlebars. And this individual was nice enough to take a four megapixel <laughs> resolution picture of that serial number and publish it when he was uh, selling, selling the bike online. And it was little, little clues like that that we were able to pick up on uh, that led us, you know, with, with absolute certainty tie bikes that were stolen in, in Colorado to the seller. It wasn't just a similar bike. It was exactly that bike that we were, were looking at. Um, this investigation had a huge uh, component uh, from the community in Colorado. You know, the sheer amount of data was too much for, for us to, to plow through. And, and we knew that, you know, Colorado wasn't our area. So we worked with about 20 uh, Colorado area anti-theft people um, in some Facebook groups. Many of these people are in the cycling industry or they are in cycling special interest groups or they you know, run a mountain bike team. They're, they're just more embedded in their community. And we were able to sort of dump this massive amount of data on this community and say, look, we found, you know, I found many, many dozens. Can, can you find me more? Can you find me victims? Um, and that, that community collaboration um, it was amazing. They, they, they pulled so many matches and were able to just deliver me more victims, more police report numbers, more case numbers. Um, the human search engine is an amazing thing. And when you can engage those communities to, you know, assist you, you know, just send an email and say, I think we found something, you know, help us dig. Um, it, it's quite amazing what you can, what you can find. Um, there was, uh, the Colorado attorney general, um, there was a, an operation that they called Vicious Cycle, uh, which is tracking commercial thieves in the, the Colorado area uh, that were, uh, as the FBI pointed out in the indictments, uh, trucking bikes down to Mexico. <laughs> and there's still a lot of gray area, but uh, you know they, these were two parallel investigations, but they're, they're definitely related. All, all these individuals are still being prosecuted and I think more information will come out. But I'm I'm positive saying that you know this this group some of the bikes that this group moved were the bikes that we were tracking. Um, we still have a lot of unanswered questions, but it was um, interesting to see an actual uh, some actual prosecutions happen out of this one. Um, all of our data was was made available to the the Colorado AG as well uh, when we published our our findings. Uh, so there is hope, <clears throat> you know, a service like us which leverages technology and, and contains a lot of data and works with victims is one thing. But when you plug in that sort of community assistance, it, it just, the recovery numbers tend to go through the roof. Um, the types of recoveries we're getting now are typically, you know, they're community spotted, they're community assisted. Uh, a lot of them are self recoveries or they're chased with their friends or people in their community. There's a lot of localized groups. Uh, again, they're typically, you know, um, special interest groups like mountain biking or road biking who, you know, everybody knows everybody in that community. And, and most of those people in that community know each other's bikes. And when you, when you need to engage with them to um, uncover more information or help a victim, um, they are a force multiplier. They're, they're quite amazing. Uh, the best ones are the ones that are heavily vetted um, that there are some screening to make sure that bad guys are not also in those groups. And, and bad guys do attempt to infiltrate those groups. We've, we found a number of thieves who want to sort of keep an eye on what their local anti-theft people are doing. Um, and then there are some, you know, just the best, <laughs> the best examples of these groups work when there, there happens to be, you know, an officer in law enforcement who's also like a triathlete <laughs> or is a road, you know, he's a mountain biker and, and he, there's some overlap between these groups and local law enforcement. Um, typically those are the sort of individuals that will, will get more engaged on the problem uh, than your sort of rank and file officer. Um, the more bikes we can register, the better this entire system works. Um, so if, if any of this is of interest to you, I would love to hear from you. Uh, my contact info I'm just Brian at bikeindex.org. I'm the most reachable human in the world. Uh, 
please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you're curious how, how Bike Index could work in your community. Uh, next up is Steve Piercy. Steve Piercy is our ambassador in Eugene, uh, and Steve Piercy is going to talk about uh, what fighting bike theft in Eugene looks like. And I'm handing it over to Steve. <laughs> trying to. Okay. Um, can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay. And you see, uh, <clears throat> do you see the full screen? No. You see the presenter view. Okay. Let me do something here. Let me switch. Uh, let me try this, get the right screen. Share screen and we'll do desktop two. That's the one I want. How's that? Is that better? Yes, Much better. Yay, okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Brian, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Piercy, and I'm a Bike Index Ambassador for Eugene, Oregon. Um, it's a volunteer position, and uh, like many of you, I've, I have had a uh, bike stolen. I've had two bikes stolen in my life, and um, when I first heard of uh, Bike Index and uh, exchanged emails with Brian, this is um, over, I think it was six or seven years ago, I uh, learned of how there was a medium size uh, fencing operation going on where a person would go up to San Francisco, buy bikes, bring them get back down to Santa Cruz and start selling them like crazy. And um, we often find that um, people who are victims of bike theft view um, will actually go back down and then buy that bike and pay what they call a stupid tax. <laughs> so uh, that kind of thing just infuriated me because, you know, as bicyclists, we view ourselves as being superhumans. We're here to be the climate justice superhumans because bicycles are awesome. They do, they solve all the problems that we could possibly have that are brought by um, overdevelopment and uh, a car dominated society bikes are really going to save uh, the planet. Um, so I'd like to uh, jump right in. Um, in, my, in my part of our presentation, I will focus on uh, Bike Index's activities at a local level in Eugene, Oregon. Um, and I'll discuss what we and our partners are doing to stop bike theft and to reunite stolen bikes with their owners. Uh, definitely, there is hope, as Brian said. Uh, I will then close with actions that your government, law enforcement, schools, uh, bike shops and clubs, and most, <clears throat> and most importantly, you can take. So let's start with governments. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background. So um, why is it really important for, for governments to pay attention to, to, bike, uh, to bike theft? And uh, for example, in the city of Eugene, its 2035 transportation system plan calls for tripling the percentage of trips made by walking, biking, and transit by 2035. And uh, that goal is now ticking away 13 years from now. Uh, or actually 2030, I mistyped that. Um, Eugene has also committed to Vision Zero a movement to eliminate deaths and serious injuries on the transportation system by implementing its Vision Zero plan. And the city of Eugene is also, it has a climate recovery ordinance. And one of its goals is to reduce community fusel fall, uh, fossil fuel use by 50% of 2010 levels by 2030. And in its study, um, they found that transportation makes up 53% of local greenhouse gas emissions, almost zero of which is with bicycles. So what do these policies have to do with bike theft? And to answer that question, I wanted to bring back a slide from Brian's presentation. 
uh, and that's namely the, the impact of bike theft to riders. Uh, as you can see in the chart in the lower right, about 48% of respondents who had their bike stolen said that they would be more likely to drive a car because of their bike being stolen. And when a person's bike gets stolen, it has a devastating impact on their mobility and livelihood. They might not be able to get to work or to school, um, or they have to spend more time uh, on public transit or walking to get to where they need to go. And that's just um, a, a waste of their productivity. Thus, if, if governments want to attain their trans transportation uh, safety, climate and equity goals, uh, as most of these policies are now being viewed through an equity lens, they must consider how to reduce bike theft and increase stolen bike recovery. Fortunately, here in the city of Eugene, uh, they have been increasing those efforts to do just that. Uh, its transportation department has been extremely welcoming to Bike Index to help register bikes at its events. Pre-pandemic, um, I would go to the um, bicycle or uh, uh, breakfast at the bike bridges, uh, at, which was held monthly throughout the nice <laughs> uh, sunny parts of the uh, season. And over the river uh, in Willamette Lane, uh, which is Springfield um, Parks and uh, Recreation Department, uh, there are wheels by the Willamette. Um, and it was basically celebrating uh, bicycling as a mode of transportation. And you get free bike breakfast or uh, get your bike tuned up and get your bike registered. Uh, anyway, after a hiatus from the pandemic, uh, Bike Index is going to return this Friday, May 6th at the e-bike expo. Uh, that'll be um, a way for people to demo e-bikes. There'll be food trucks and music and of course, bike registration. Uh, another thing that the city of Eugene does is it defines bike parking standards. In its um, Eugene city code, they include minimum bicycle parking spaces for various land uses. Uh, they also describe types of secure bike racks uh, and storage and technical spe specifications for those things. Uh, currently, these, these standards are in the process of being updated for cargo bikes and other larger bikes, as well as for uh, House Bill 2001, which is the middle housing amendments. Uh, Eugene also offer offers uh, secure public bike locker lockers, and um, our public transit agency, Lane Transit District, uh, offers a few more locations for bike locker rentals. So, our governments are trying to do things to help deter bike theft and prevent your bikes from getting stolen. So this, these are some of the things that your governments can do. The next uh, uh, group is law enforcement. Um, in 2020, the Eugene Police Department reported 481 stolen bicycles, which is an increase over 2019. Uh, we think that part of that is that there was a huge shift in how people were moving around. Uh, they, fewer people were on public transit and decided to get a bike. Um, and along with that, when there's more bikes being out in, in circulation, um, there's an increase in bike theft. So in that same year, um, Bike Index uh, reported that within a 30 mile radius of Eugene, there were 127 stolen bikes, and that's its highest count ever since we started in 2013. And when you add up all of those stolen bikes, that, that's a lot of bikes that end up in the uh, Eugene Police Department property room. Um, one other thing, though, is that um, even though these are just reported bikes, there's a lot more of, but there's a lot more bikes that are not reported stolen. Easily, it's probably around anywhere like uh, the, the, the percentage of bikes that are stolen and then reported is somewhere like one in four. To me, that's just a kind of off the cuff estimate. 
Uh, most stolen bikes are just not reported for various reasons. Either the bike has very little value, um, a lot of people have no hope of recovery, or there's a lack of trust in law enforcement. Um, and this is especially true for unhoused persons. Um, there's uh, locally here in Eugene, there's a, uh, a, uh, a group called Bent Spoke uh, Knickerbockers, and they're a grassroots humanitarian effort to assist the unhoused. They deliver food, clothing, personal items, and aid by bicycle. And they are out on the paths and streets every day here in Eugene. And I asked them how often their clients report a stolen bike. And they responded almost daily. So that's another 300 stolen bikes per year that are just not reported stolen. It's a huge problem. So what are some of the things that law enforcement can do? And uh, here's a few suggestions. So um, first of all, uh, Bike Index uh, locally collaborates, uh, actively collaborates with law enforcement. And we help victims recover their stolen bikes. Uh, in this case, um, shown on this Facebook post, this resulted in the arrest of two individuals, one of whom had a warrant for a stolen car, kidnapping, and strangulation. And the other uh, suspect had a decades-long history of property theft and other crimes. Um, so when we are able to collaborate and uh, between uh, Bike Index and law enforcement, Law enforcement benefits by getting people who commit criminal acts into the system, whether that is criminal justice system, treatment, or other services, doesn't matter. It, it helps improve their public image. It also helps build trust with both the community that they serve and especially the rightful bike owner. I mean, getting your bike back is awesome. It's a great feeling. Um, second, Bike Index offers a uh, dashboard to law enforcement. Uh, it integrates with Leads Online, a nationwide database used by pawn shops to identify stolen property. Uh, and this can help law enforcement to conduct, um, to conduct investigations and reunite stolen bikes. And along with that, often other stolen properties, um, jewelry, uh, power tools, garden, like uh, contractors are often hit, and uh, uh, electronics, computers, cell phones, all those things are high value, easy to move uh, items. And uh, with having this kind of a dashboard, you can start by finding bikes. Those are one of the few things that actually have a serial number that uh, is easy to track and it's easy to record and get tracked. Um, so, you know, with law enforcement joining uh, and working with, uh, with Bike Index, there is an incredible improvement. Um, so here's a great success story. In, in uh, Bike Index partners with uh, the Cal Calgary Police in Alberta, Canada. Calgary has an astoundingly high rate of stolen bike recovery at 21.5%. That's just, mind boggling whereas here in Eugene, uh, our currently uh, rate of bike, uh, currently our bike of um, recovery of stolen bikes is about 8%. So when you have law enforcement partnering with bike index, you make a huge impact. I mean, almost double or triple what you normally would do when the community is just doing it by itself. So having law enforcement actively involved really puts a dent in uh, bike theft and uh, that crime. And here in Eugene though, although we have been working to get the local cities, police departments and county sheriff to sign up in bike index, we have yet to navigate the bureaucracy successfully. So if you happen to know somebody, please refer them to me because I wanna get them signed up. Uh, our next group is uh, schools, and schools have very similar issues to cities. Large universities and colleges struggle with car parking and uh, encourage walking, biking, and riding transit instead. Uh, and when you encourage biking, that means that uh, you specifically have high rates of bike theft <laughs> to go along with that. Um, 
schools additionally have issues with students locking bikes in areas that block access or shouldn't really be there, uh, especially for people living with disabilities. I mean, if you lock your bike up to a handrail that's uh, on a ramp, that's not polite and it's not a good thing. It blocks access for people who need to be able to move around. Um, and to counteract that, uh, Bike Index offers stickers with QR codes. Uh, so if you have your smartphone with you or uh, any kind of mobile device, you can scan that QR code, look up the bike's owner, and contact them and say, hey, your bike is uh, locked up to uh, a handrail. You need to come get it and unlock it and remove it. And if you don't, that's fine. We'll just take it to the impound and you'll, <laughs> you'll have to recover it there. But it's a good idea for you to come and get it now so we don't have to cut your lock. Um, the next group is for bike shops. Um, bike shops are critical to uh, how uh, we collaborate. Uh, they use Bike Index to automatically register bikes through their point of sale system, that's POS. Uh, and uh, we integrate with um, Ascend and Lightspeed. Uh, bike shops can also manually register bikes. Um, after signing up, bike shops can collect a customer, customer's email address and input that into their POS. And uh, <clears throat> when they make a sale, all of that bike's information will get automatically registered in Bike Index under both the customer's email address and the bike shop's dashboard. The bike shop will always have a record of uh, that bike. And so if it ever gets stolen, uh, they can, um, the customer can contact the bike shop and say, hey, I don't have my registration, can you help me out? So they have their back. Uh, bike shops can also educate about bike security and sell bike locks. So or other anti-theft devices. Uh, so it's a good thing to touch on that when uh, you're making a sale. Um, finally, uh, bike shops that don't sign up, they can still search bike index whenever a bike is brought in for repair. And in fact, we have one local bike shop that uh, reported that they help reunite a stolen bike with its owner about once per month. And when a bike shop provides that kind of service, they have a customer for life. The next group that we uh, interact with are bike clubs. And uh, bike clubs can sign up as an organization in Bike Index. Here in Eugene, we have the Greater Eugene Area Riders, known as GEARS. And they have sponsored me as a Bike Index ambassador for the region uh, by making a charitable con financial contribution to Bike Index. Um, Gears also publishes articles in their newsletter from time to time that I write for them. Uh, they host and they host um, a bike index bike registration form and an active list of stolen bikes on their website. So they get the word out. Um, these benefits are provided to the club's members and shared with the community. Uh, anyone can sign up. Uh, can register their bike online. And it helps peers because, hey, we're getting new members and we're becoming better advocates for bicycling uh, and bicycle infrastructure in our area. Let's get together. Uh, uh, currently, Gears has uh, 691 bikes registered in Bike Index. And that's uh, with over 200 of those just in the last year. And we've been operating for about three and a half years. So I hope to continue and accelerate that pace uh, going forward. And again, the more participants that we have, the broader our network is and the bigger dent we can put in uh, bike theft. The last group is individuals. So um, what can you as an individual do? Well, first, register your bikes. <laughs> in bike index, and hopefully before they're stolen. Uh, and when you do that, uh, you can re if you do get your bike stolen, you would report it in bike index uh, in the Eugene area. And then we would, uh, after, of course, filing a police report, uh, we would then send out notifications via Twitter and Facebook. Uh, in this example, this was not too long ago, within the last month, um, a couple of our sharp-eyed Facebook group members reported 
this is almost guaranteed a stolen bike. And we're looking at the, the bike picture on the right. Uh, I went to check it out, but it was way too sketchy. Rattle can painted with do-it-yourself do salsa decals added. Be very careful with these guys. It felt like a mugging about to happen too. And so when this person posted this uh, through, um, shared it the, the Facebook marketplace post in our Facebook group, another member recalled a recent post in the group and they connected the dots. Uh, they said, was this the salsa? And the person who went and checked out the bike said, almost certainly yes. And we started to get in touch with the owner. Um, but unfortunately, this seller evaded capture. Within 24 hours, they had deleted their profile and the posting of the bike. And so we weren't able to get, catch them this time. Um, anyway, with Bike Index, and this is unique to Bike Index, there are people who are actively combing through local online fencing operations. I mean, offer up Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist to spot suspicious posts. And we talk about it and we try to help uh, the bike owners try to catch the thieves. So um, another thing that you can do is to, as an individual, is to educate yourself how to prevent bike theft. Uh, and the number one way that bikes get stolen is by just leaving them out in plain view without a lock or with a skimpy cable lock that is easily defeated. Uh, we recommend that owners keep their bikes indoors as much as possible and never store bikes unlocked in an open carport, fence backyard, patio, or balcony. We've had people uh, who would climb up to a second or even third story balcony, throw the bike down on the ground, pop back down to the ground and right off. <laughs> it happens. Um, we always recommend that you use two locks, one of which is a strong U-lock. Uh, Kryptonite or Avis are really good uh, U-lock brands. And um, if you have uh, two locks, it takes twice as long to steal as a bike that only has a single lock. And when you do that, these prefer easier pickings and they are more likely to go off to, um, you know, uh, an unlocked bike or one that has a bad lock. We also warn that people be aware of secure bike storage on site at apartment complexes, schools, and businesses. Um, if a thief can see your bike through a chain link fence, they will find a way to defeat the security and sweep the entire secure bike storage. Finally, uh, you can do several things to reduce bike theft. Number one, register your bike now. Just do it. <laughs> uh, number two, do not use online fencing sites. Do not encourage bike theft. If you, have, if you want to sell a used or purchase an owner verified bike, use Bike Fair or go to a retailer in your town. Uh, with, a, with keeping in mind that if a bike price is too good to be true, it probably is, and it was probably stolen. Uh, third, join our Facebook group. Here in Lane County, we have Stolen Bikes Eugene, Lane County. And we also have a Twitter feed at Bike Index Huge. And finally, um, volunteer and become a Bike Index Ambassador. It's a lot of fun and you get a lot of grateful people when you do help them get their bikes back. And, and doing any of these things will help you keep your bike safe. And when you keep your bike safe, you continue being a climate justice superhuman. With that, I want to close and say thank you. And uh, I think we're ready to um, uh, accept questions. There have been some uh, updated stats published in the chat. Uh, you probably missed these as you were presenting, but I think there are some uh, better, better reported statistics for bicycle recovery in your area. <laughs> yeah, Shane, I'd like to get, I saw that, but I wanted to get your source of that because the EPD is different and there, you might be including University of Oregon PD. Um, I, the ones that Eugene Police reported are, are the ones that I cited. Yeah, so we have a question. Uh, 
also from Shane, can you highlight the difference between bike index and project 529? Uh, project 529 is a, is a bike index competitor. Uh, of course, again, uh, we, of course, are nonprofit. Uh, project 529 is a for profit organization. Uh, we've been around longer. Um, I had a prior service started in the, in the early 2000s that was merged into Bike Index. I've been doing this for about 20 years. Uh, Project 529 came around in 2013. Um, we, I mean, we both sort of, sort of do the same functions, right? We do registration, we do recovery. Um, I think our net is wider. Um, Project 529 has been operating a lot in Canada which is fine. We also operate in Canada. Um, philosophically, we're very different organizations. Uh, Project 529 is not out there hunting down transnational bicycle theft crime groups. Bike Index is doing that pretty much daily. Um, Bike Index is, you know, we're, we're a community, we're grassroots, we're, you know, bike hackers, computer guys. Uh, Project 529 IC is basically a police product. Um, from their product offerings to even their aesthetic, their, their color scheme, their website, their operations. It is, it is a product that is built for police. Um, there is community usership of it, but I, I would say our community usership is, is quite high. Um, there's an independent guy, uh, this guy in Seattle who runs Bicycle Security Advisors who published a, a much longer comparison between the, the two services. Um, it's a little dated in terms of numbers. Um, but I would encourage you to look up bicycle security advisors uh, in Seattle and check out their article that compares the two services. Uh, I could talk about this at length uh, on, on many, many granular levels uh, about specific operations. You know, our, our data is open. Uh, Project 529, as I believe, does not have open data. Um, when you're looking at 529, you're seeing a lot of bike index bikes, which are denoted by bike index logos. Uh, the, the converse is not true uh, and, and so forth. I have a couple other points too. Um, so uh, one, the one big thing is that Bike Index has uh, an open API for web-based um, integration. Um, it's, and then um, point of sale integration for bike shops. Uh, uh, bike Index has both light speed and Ascend, whereas Project 529, I'm not sure if they ever got around to getting Ascend integrated. Yeah, um, and, and like even the, the pawn uh, partnership, like we're gonna bore everyone to death, but like, you know, Bike Index ties into this other automated system that is used by um, pawn shops across the country. Yeah, um, leads and online, and that's, leads online. That's, yeah. that's, that's unique to Bike Index. Yeah, um, so we, we have a lot of sort of technical, um, weird technical aspects that may be of interest uh, specifically to law enforcement, but I don't, I don't wanna bore everybody to death here. <laughs> so. yeah. But I think, I think the, one of the strongest selling points is that Bike Index has ambassadors and these people who are raving lunatics about recovering stolen bikes. I mean, we're the people out there doing the work that, you know, Project 529 just sits back and says, give us the money. <laughs> um, and one other thing is that they're overpriced comparatively to Bike Index. So if they if a uh, law enforcement entity or university or uh, city decides to have uh, a dashboard, you get a, you get all the you get all the stuff that Bike Index offers as well as Project Five Twenty Nine, but at a significant. Lower we, cost. We, we, we've tried to promote a lot of interoperability. You know, you know, it's uh, competition is fine. Competition is good, um, but I think if. Uh, if you're if you're looking at organizationally how we function, um, there's a lot of the you know clearly I'm biased, but there's a lot of pros in, in the bike index camp. Um, we have other questions. Yeah, uh, Shane had a <clears throat> follow up of how can communities via police, cities, and community groups help promote bike index more versus Project Five Twenty Nine or others, uh, or even just versus not <laughs> not registering. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're always on the lookout. We we will talk to anyone from, um, you know, schools to individual buyers and sellers to retailers to universities to, um, you know, literally any entity that comes into contact with a lot of bikes. And, and we're sort of figuring out where we fit in that process. So, you know, schools, they want sort of bread and butter registration. Uh, they also want asset management. So at the end of the year, when 20,000 freshmen leave 10,000 bikes behind, uh, someone just walks along and goes whoop, and scans a bike, uh, and then that student is, is auto notified. Hey, you got to come get your bike, or it's going to get impounded. Um, there, uh, we've recently started working with a lot of retailers. Um, there are some really high-end online retailers who um, 
they use bike index sort of on both ends of the equation. So I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Pro's Closet. Pro's Closet will, will buy your really high-end carbon fiber racing bike from you, fix it up a little bit, and then sell it on their own marketplace. Um, so they, they will use bike index to vet bikes that are coming in to guarantee that they're not participating in fencing. And then they will register bikes when they, they go out the door um, to you know basically help that owner keep that bike for as long as they can. And that matters because you know we found pros closet bikes in that massive um, Mexican cycling pipeline, and we were sort of able to to you know dig a little deeper on those bikes because we were seeing pros closet decals. Um, some app developers have approached us because they they too want to replicate marketplaces. Uh, they you know they they want we're and we're all for anybody who wants to use our data to make their marketplace safer my phone number is below you know we'll, we'll work with those guys as long as we possibly can um, as opposed to you know entities like offer up who you know we've attempted uh, productive dialogue for over five six years and, and they just resist um, addressing the problem um, so we you know our data is available to anybody who wants it um, our partnership is pretty much available to anybody who wants it we're just a bunch of bike nerds that wanted to build the system that didn't exist, that we wanted to exist. Um, and every single day we're running into people who, who have great ideas and say, well, wait a minute, I'm a you know K-12 system or I'm a building apartment manager. Why don't you guys do this? And, and we'll vet it and we'll, we'll put it on the plate and we'll typically build it. Um, so I, that was a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> I, hope that, <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think... I think what I found is uh, as a bike index ambassador, the most effective way is to be in person. Unfortunately, pandemic has put a dent in that operation, but um, we've learned how to deal with it. I've gone to every single bike shop in the city of Eugene, and I have spoken with the owners and said, please, do you want to do this? And it, it first they're like, no, we don't have, we don't trust uh, any technology. Blah, blah, blah. But a couple have come around and have actually fully embraced it, and um, it's amazing because when they start to participate, we we are doing a better job of recovering and reuniting stolen bikes with their owners. Um, I have been lobbying law enforcement, uh, universities, uh, every city that I can get to. <laughs> so you know the in person um, in person contacts are super helpful, and whenever. Whenever um, bike theft comes up, just say bike index. To, to answer, um, there's Paul. a question. Um, do you know why there is a significant reduction in bike thefts in Portland in 2021? Um, I, I don't. Anecdotally, um, it's just because 2020 was such a completely bananas year on, on every act. Like uh, the combination of COVID, the combination of bike stop shop thefts, the combination of supply chain issues. Um, Every single city that we operate in, 2020 was the worst year, hands down. Um, we, you know, we here in Portland, we had shops that were getting hit on Monday, on Thursday, and on Sunday um, during during the summer. And we we would have uh, we let our retailers do mass registration. So we, you know, I would log in and see. I'm not going to say their name, but you know, ma major retailer here saying, "Here's the 45 bikes we got stolen last night," and they would do it again on Wednesday, and they would do it again on Sunday. Um, it it was a mess. Um, so. I don't know if that's a drop or just a more return to normalcy, <laughs> uh, just because 2020 was so terrible. Um, if you want to hit me up afterwards, I can maybe dig into it a little more and, and provide better, better, more granular data. Um, most cities, 2020, 2021, were, were completely off the charts. This is the first year things feel like a little more normal. 2022 numbers are a little more, a more baseline. Uh, Tom Higgs asked, uh, I don't know if I missed anything, does Bike Index register more than bikes? Yes, we do. Uh, we do scooters, we do trailers, uh, we do unicycles. Um, basically, the only thing we're doing a lot of e-bikes and there's a lot of weird e-bike hybrids. Uh, the only thing I will bump is motorcycles. Um, and I should start motorcycle index because there are so many <laughs> motorcycles that guys try to sneak in under the radar. Um, yeah, and we just we, gas is where we draw the line. Um, so we we get some sort of weird sort of e-bike hybrid motorcycle looking things, but as long as it's electric, we'll take it. Um, and as long as there's some sort of tracking system, um, we, you know, we'll, we'll, like a serial number or whatever, we'll take it. Uh, um, I wanted to just check with Polina. You um, had your hand raised and then you asked a question. Did we answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question then is from Julie Van Horn. 
Uh, and to clarify, Bike Index is open to enroll from anywhere. Medford area as well? You betcha. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yes, it's, uh, you can just go to bikeindex.org and use and start using that. Or if you have a, a bike club, a bike shop, or any, any bikey thing, a city that you want to encourage to become uh, a center for getting bikes registered, get that online. So absolutely, uh, you can do this through schools. To your question about the student bikes K-12, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we've seen those targeted as well because they're typically soft, soft targets. Yeah, um, we, you know, individual schools can um, sign up. We, we do get a couple of school systems that run. I don't know what the, the, the school setup is like in your area, but we'll, we'll often have regional school partners that may have five to 10 um, K-12 and then some some high schools in there. And we'll we'll turn them on as a single entity. Um, so you can have, you know, one one single en entity, which is the X school system, and then all their branches can can. Uh, can use it. Uh, Cameron Bennett says, I had a bike recovered last week thanks to Bike Index. Thank you all enough. Absolutely. Sweet. So glad to hear it. Uh, if you want to tell us how it came about or who found it or what, what the situation was, you know, by all means. Like this, this is what I, this, this is the only reason I, I open my email every morning, right? Like I love <laughs> seeing the recoveries. I love, you know, there's a, there's a real sort of um, rhythm to it. You know, in the morning I wake up, and I read all the bad stuff that happened last night. I see all the bad bikes that came in. And during the day, we may interface with victims and put two and two together and get some leads. And by evening, we've already hooked up some recoveries. Um, and I, I love those recoveries. I, I used to write up at the end of every month um, every single bike recovery that came through Bike Index. And, and there was a point that that just became completely untenable. Um, and But I like the weird stories. I like the... You know who found it? Where'd they find it? Uh, you know our current records. I think is a 12-year recovery. Uh, we just had a couple eights last week, so there was a bike that'd be gone eight years out. We'll get bikes going, you know, across borders, across cities. Um, uh, we have I call them stolen bike turduckens, where it's a stolen bike in, inside of a stolen car, which then winds up in someone's home. So we get yeah, they found my bike. You know, it was in a Porsche. That Porsche wound up in somebody's living room. Like got my bike back. Um, so thanks, thanks for letting us know, Cameron. Uh, question, I've been super curious about what people do with the enormous amount of bike wheels that get stolen. Hard to imagine there's so much demand for used wheels locally. Yes. Um, I think they're a byproduct, <laughs> you know, that you can only sell so much of these things. Um, the, there are people who will piece out, piece and part out bikes, collect that singular part and then move them elsewhere and sell them as a batch. Um, so we'll, we'll see individual sellers who, you know, there's frame guy and then, you know, there's brake guy, and it's just you're just buying a giant box of of this thing. Um, and most of those most of the sites I mentioned before are are you know directly responsible for that. Um, we do see thieves that will obfuscate bikes by mixing and matching and, and shopping and parting. So if you have ten bikes and you don't want those ten owners to find you, it's advantageous to to sort of switch the parts around and you know switch the wheels, switch the components. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, Cameron says, we follow GPS things at Selwood. We think we scared the guy knocking on doors and he brought it back and dumped it. A neighbor found it behind a barrier near a South Waterfront apartment. Found his Dubai Connects. Fantastic. Was this the van move that you were trying to track and the tracking is really iffy? I think I, think I remember. Yeah, this, the, this was the same bike. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that came back. Um, van, van moves are really cool. They're e-bikes that have built-in GPS tracking, um, but the, the GPS is sort of wonky. So you're getting like here's the half mile radius in which we think your bike showed up and it's it's almost completely unusable um it's not granular enough for, for someone to go you know um, typically get anything that will point out where that bike is um i'm glad they have it but it's it's uh, it could use a little bit of refinement so cool i think we got like one minute left if anybody has a really short question throw it out there otherwise i want to say thank you everyone for for joining thank you steve for um his presentation as well um, and yeah, if, if we leave you with one thing, tips uh, tips for a way to further ID your bike if the number might be removed. The number only way to remember. No, uh, take a bunch of pictures. Uh, if your bike has configuration, scratches, stickers, dings, dents, take pictures of that, upload it when you do your bike index uh, listing. We recover a stunning amount of bikes with no serial number. Um, and that is because we're able to visually identify them and identify things about them that, that make us 100% sure that it's the same bike. And that can be everything from, I scratched my frame and I was super angry about it and I took a picture of it, or I, I put this weird sticker for this one weird coffee shop, you know, on, on the down tube and I'm looking at 
Craigslist their offer up and I see that same sticker. Um, so we, you know, we tell people, you know, it's free, it takes like two minutes, just take out your phone, take a couple pictures of your bike, register, and um, and you'll never hear from us again unless it gets stolen. So I think we're at time. So thanks everybody.